Hello, my name is Carrie Allen and I am a consultant pharmacist. I'm here to talk to you today about the five elements of a great med pass. If you pass meds, you know that there's a lot more than five, but these are the five major basic areas that you should be concerned with when someone's watching you do a med pass, but also just on a day-to-day -day basis. So here are the basics. Professionalism. You need a name tag, your appearance has to be professional, and your med cart has to be clean and organized. You have to worry about HIPAA, that's privacy, and dignity for the residents. You need to cover your Mars, you have to give residents respect, you have to give residents privacy. Don't just be lifting up their shirt in the middle of the hallway to check stuff you need to check. Worry about the technical stuff. It seems like it's not a big deal, or it seems like it's overwhelming. There seem to be two camps. But the technical stuff is something to worry about. How you crush meds. If you can, crush meds. If the order is correct. Your administration technique. And we'll go through a little of this all in detail in a minute. Infection control. Wash your hands. There is sanitizer, and there's an appropriate time to use sanitizer. But sanitizer is misnamed. It doesn't sanitize your hands so that anything that you come in contact with is automatically killed. That's not how it works. You have to keep applying it, and you have to wash your hands in between. And it doesn't kill all bugs, and we'll talk about that as well. Don't touch people's pills that they're going to be putting in their mouth or anything else with your hands. Don't let those eyedropper tips touch the eye or the eyelashes. Make sure your pill counters, if you're counting pills, are clean. Make sure those crushers are clean as well. And med safety. Are the meds stored correctly? Are they at the right temperature? Are they expired? That's not a good thing. Are the controlled substances double locked? Is the cart locked? And are the keys secured? You can't be leaving your keys out. I'm probably going to hit that ad nauseum today because I see a lot of that when I'm watching people do med passes. So professionalism. It's not all about you at the workplace, but it kind of is. So it's not about you showing your individuality, even though we are all individuals and residents love us for that, but it's really about presenting yourself in a way that shows you're competent to do the job so that people have trust in you, both your superiors at work, both the people you're taking care of, and their families. Um, I could, you know, I couldn't find a great definition of professionalism that was specific to long-term care, and I looked long and hard, so I made a little amalgam of a definition that I think fits, and it's basically the application of specialized knowledge, which you all have specialized knowledge, nurses, med aides, CNAs, you, you've all been trained specially. It's the application of that knowledge in the workplace while simultaneously showing your dedication, your responsibility, courtesy to the resident, and care for the resident that goes beyond just doing the job. It's beyond just the bare minimum. If you are a person who wants to do assembly line work and not care, long-term care isn't for you. Let me tell you that right now. Okay, professionalism. In appearance, wear your name tag. You will notice I am not wearing a name tag right now. If I came to pass meds for you, that might be a problem. Who is this person? Appearance, you want to be neat, clean, and professional. You don't want gunk underneath your fingernails. You don't want to look like you just got out of bed. Residents can look like they've just gotten out of bed. You should not look like you just got out of bed. People aren't going to trust you to be giving the meds and measuring things accurately and injecting them with things if you look like you just had a bender for three days and then put on some pajamas and came to work. Med cart organization. It needs to be orderly. If you put your meds by route of administration, so eye drops in one area, ear drops in another area, patches in one area, topical creams in one area, PO meds in another area, that's the easiest fix. The regs say that you just have to separate internals from externals, but if you do it my way, which is a little more stringent, that cart's going to look good and you're not going to make as many mistakes. It has to be clean. If you spilled sticky, gooey senna or cough syrup anywhere, you need to clean that up and you need to clean it up right away. No food of any kind. I don't care who brought it to you. I don't care if it's for a resident. I don't care if you didn't have your coffee in the morning. And believe me, I understand the need for coffee in the morning. I do. But have it before you get to work. Don't put it on that med cart. There's some pitfalls, though, in our field to professionalism. So if you're a med aide or an LVN or an RN, you're intimately caring and connecting with these people. And that can lead to some lax behavior. 
So we just have to be aware of that and, and take that in and, and treat ourselves as though we are professionals every single day. And don't let the residents derail you. Sometimes the residents and the families will derail you. Oh, come sit down and talk with me during my breakfast and have some of these tamales my grandmother made. Not during that med pass. You can't be doing that. The nursing homes and assisted livings are homey environments, but it's not your home. So let's try not to act as though we're at home. You're also pulled in a lot of different directions, and you become stressed and drained. You're caring for people. That drains you. And sometimes that leads us to be lax in our jobs. So what we need to do is just work a little bit harder in remaining professional and giving ourselves care so that we're not too stressed. You have to be able to multitask, though. Life isn't fair. Reviewers, including me and surveyors, will watch much more closely if your cart is sloppy or you look sloppy. If you have food on your cart, I guarantee you I will probably do a narcotic audit on your cart because it's kind of sneaky. We all know we're not supposed to have food on our carts. It's as if the rules don't apply to you. So I'm going to start looking for other areas where you might think the rules don't apply to you. So as not fair as that sounds, that's probably what's going to happen if, if your cart looks bad or you look bad. And it's gross. Food should be kept away from meds. Bugs like food. We don't need any bugs near our meds. And what if your waiter at a nice restaurant had his Coke and some snacks on your tray and came to serve you food while he's snacking on food and drinking from a drink? It's inappropriate, and it doesn't provide good service. There's service in all industries, including ours. Dignity and HIPAA. The Mars have to be covered every time you go to give a med, but sometimes we have to flag stuff to remind us. Most MARS on the left-hand side will have all the patient information, but on the right-hand side, it's just sort of the ends of sentences and those kind of things. So if you have to flag your MARS, flag them to the right and keep that MAR book covered so that patient information isn't showing. You want to cover notes if you have a notebook that contains vitals. Cover those up or keep them with you in a pocket. Blister packs or bottles, what you want to do is you want to cross out the prescription number the name, anything that's traceable, especially if it's going to go in the trash. So, for example, we have here a bottle that has the prescription number crossed out with a Sharpie, and it's crossed out. Sometimes you can see through the Sharpies. We don't want you to be able to see through this. The doctor's name also crossed out, and the resident's name is crossed out. And some people think, well, why do I have to cross out the prescription number? Well, because you know what? I have the pharmacy number over here, and if I have the prescription number, it doesn't take too much check-in to figure out who's on what med. So, and some people are interested in that. Most of us don't care about prying into others' lives, but some people do. So you can also rip this off and put it in the shred bin, but make sure that everything's covered up. And it goes the same way on blister packs. And that's before it goes in the trash. Some people will wait and have a whole stack, and then they'll put it in the trash later, but they'll leave it out where people can see. Do it the minute you need to throw that away. If you have a reorder stack of blister packs, don't leave them on the cart, even if they're turned upside down. Keep them in the cart or elsewhere so that people can't see the names and medications that people are on. Dignity. The resident needs privacy and respect. This is their home and we are there to provide some service to them. So let's not do blood sugar checks or give insulin in the hall. I can't tell you how many times I've watched from afar and someone's pulling open someone's clothes to check down here, you know, and make sure that their blood sugar is okay or doing finger sticks and there's blood everywhere. It's privacy, it's dignity, it's infection control. Do that in a private area. If you're in a room, pull the curtain so people can't see you from the hall. Don't do blood pressures at the dinner table. There's privacy for vitals. Everybody doesn't need to know what everybody else's blood pressure is. Don't bring the med cart into the dining area. That helps to make it a less enjoyable experience for everyone. It makes it more industrial. It makes it more like a hospital. People need to relax and be able to enjoy their meals. You want to minimize the number of meds that are given with meals, if at all possible. Sometimes you do have to bring meds into the room. Don't bring the cart into the room. And be quiet and discreet when you're telling people about their meds. Always identify yourself and why you're in a resident room or why you're coming up to a resident. Hello, my name is Carrie. If you already know the resident, hi, Mrs. Butcher, my name is Carrie. Hi, Mrs. Butcher, it's Carrie with your medications. Let them know what medications you're giving and answer any questions that the resident has. It's important that you know why you're giving each medication specific to the resident. So, for example, warfarin, which is a blood thinner. 
If you have a mechanical valve or you have atrial fibrillation or you've had a history of a DVT, we may look at that differently. We may observe the resident differently. And of course, the lab values may be targeted differently. But if someone has a history of a DVT and we know that, we know that's why they're getting warfarin. If they say to you when you go in to give any med at any time, you know, my leg is swollen and it hurts. You might think to yourself, oh, I need to go get the nurse. Or if you're the nurse, you might think to yourself, oh, we need to rule out a DVT. It's important to know why people are giving meds. And just so you know, you know, I was an aerobics instructor for like 17 years or so, and we actually had to know what all the classes of meds were and what they could do to people, just in case someone fell down in the middle of class or they had question for us, why, you know, why isn't my heart rate going up or why do I feel dizzy? Well, are you on a beta blocker? So if an aerobics instructor can do it, nurses and med aides can do it, let me tell you. Okay, technical stuff. So we're getting to the long haul here with the technical passing of medications and, and I just want anyone who's out there who's a, an administrator or a financial officer or anyone who hasn't passed meds, can I just tell you that passing meds is not easy. People think it's easy and it's not. And the logistics are easy math. If you have 20 people with five meds a piece, you have to pass and watch. You have to watch them swallow those. You have to encourage water. You have to wash your hands. You have to do that in about an hour. That's about 100 meds in an hour. And it's often three times that. So it's tricky. It's easy to make a mistake. As we all know, mistakes with medications can kill people and lawsuits are expensive. So if you're someone who's in charge of staffing and hours and money, please think before you're cutting hours too, too much because this part is not as easy as it seems. And we're gonna go through just the basics, but before we get to that, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services, did a study from 1997 to 2008, and this was just published the other day, so I thought I would put this up here. And basically, hospital admissions for all medication and drug-related conditions increased in people 45 and older by a great deal. 45 to 64 year olds increased by 117%. This is having to do with medication issues. Some of it had to do with illicit drugs, but a great deal of it had to do with even over-the-counters and prescription drugs. From ages 65 to 84, those admissions for med problems increased by 96%. For 85 and older, increased by 87%, and they really focused hard on delirium from medications on this, which can be caused by giving meds an error, so be careful. All right, when you are passing meds, the most, most, most important thing is, is the order correct? Are you giving the right medication as, as the doctor ordered it? So make sure that doctor's order in the chart matches the medication administration record, that MAR, and it make sure it matches the blister pack bottle. You have to do your triple checks. Use your change in direction stickers if the meds you have can still be used, but perhaps the directions have changed. So let me show you. Change of direction stickers are used, let's say you have to give two medications or two pills rather than just one. Normally there would be a label right here that had the resident's information on it, but for privacy we decided to remove that. You would put right near the label, right where the directions would be. Don't put it off to the side where nobody can see it or is gonna pay attention to it. Put it right where the directions are, like so. And it says, directions changed, refer to chart. Now also, you should be referring to your MAR because once the directions have changed in the chart, the nurse needs to transcribe that in the MAR. But this allows us to still use the same medications. And the thing of it is, in Texas, the dad's department there, they say you have to. If you can still use those meds, you need to use the direction change sticker and refer to the chart. And the person who needs to make this decision and set this putting direction sticker on there is the nurse because they're the ones that can do calculations. In Texas, we can't do calculations if we're med aids to determine these kind of things. And why can't you just write over the label and change it? The thing with that is, is it's not legal. It's not within a nursing scope of practice or a med aid scope of practice. It is within my scope of practice as a pharmacist. However, if I'm not the person who originally packaged that med and I don't have the original bottle that it came out of, I can't be doing that either. 
So make sure that we're not writing over the labels. And it seems like a good idea, and I understand why people want to do it, but it can create errors, and it's not in our scope of practice. Be prepared with your supplies. Okay. The most important thing, you need meds. Got to get those meds. Make sure you have the meds before you start the med pass. I can't tell you how many times people are in the middle of a med pass I'm watching, and it's, oh, I don't have that med. Well, that was the most important thing. We have to make sure we get those. The cart, take it with you when you can. People tend to leave the cart, and what they do is they have medication bottles, and they stack those and paper cups all together, and you can see how my hands are touching these, and the bottom of the bottle is touching the top of this, and someone's going to put that maybe in their mouth. It's not sanitary. Use your cart when you can. Let that be a tool for you. Always, always take your keys with you. Keep them in your pocket. Do not cover them up and leave them just sitting on the cart or in the MAR book, those kind of things. You have, you have to keep control of those keys. Make sure that you have water and that it's dated. And that seems silly to some people, but I, people do bad things, let me tell you. You want to make sure that you could use tape. You could use the, um, let me turn this this way. You could use a Sharpie just on the disposable part here, and we have a date listed there. We know that, that this is the day, and you're probably going to refill it over and over and over again on that day, but then the next day you're changing it out. You don't want to have people have stagnant water, and you want to make sure that you have a top. It needs to be covered. We don't want dust or gross things, people's hair, eyelashes falling in here. That's not what we need to have happen. And before I was a pharmacist, I actually worked in microbiology, which is the study of bugs and diseases. And so I'm even more paranoid than most people about that. But let me tell you, gross things can happen. Things can fall in there. If you have um, puddings or jellies for mixing, make sure those are also dated and covered. Also make sure that you're not giving your diabetic residents a bunch of sugar-filled items when you're giving them their meds. Make sure that you have both medication and drinking cups. Medication cups typically look like this. They are just little souffle cups. My mom calls them taco cups. I'm not sure why, but just make sure you have those available to give people meds. Sometimes people use the little plastic cups like so. Make sure that your water Cups for your residents, if they're not big enough, most people are going to the four ounce cups, the little cups right now because they're easier to store in stock. But we need four and mostly eight ounces of water to give medications. So, especially for things like potassium, those kind of things. So, you know, offer them more water. Bring two cups if you need to. Refill their cup. Make sure you have enough water. When you have a spoon stored on the side of your cart, make sure that the handle portion here is stored outside. So that's the part where someone is walking by and they happen to brush against your cart, they're going to be brushing against this end part. You don't want this part stored out because that's the part that goes in people's mouths. So, you know, you have residents that maybe are demented, maybe they're picking at areas of their body that aren't so sanitary, they're walking by your cart just touching things. You don't want that spoon to go in someone's mouth if that's what happens. So you store these with the handles out. And that's something people forget from time to time. Okay, tissues. Make sure you always, always, always have your tissues. You need those for eye drops. You need those for nasal sprays. Sometimes you need them to help people wipe their hands. Paper towels are also good for people wiping their hands. They are not good for people wiping their eyes because they're too rough. You need trash and you need a sharp container. So if you have anything that's sharp, anything that's broken, it can go right in there. It's not going to harm anyone. And you make sure that your trash is empty before your shift so that you can put items in it as needed. If you are a nurse and you're going to be pulling up insulin or perhaps you're going to be maybe pulling up some phenergan or promethazine from one of those vials that you break open, you guys all know about those vials, you need a filter needle. Those glass particulates can get in there. And sometimes I don't see filter needles on the carts or people don't have access to those. You can get a glass embolus when you are actually injecting that into someone. So you make sure you have your filter needles. Make sure that you have gloves and 
they are the correct size. And I'm going to put on some gloves here. I have kind of small hands. So I'm just going to show you really quick. You can see my gloves going to go underneath here. And, but you can see they might be just a little big. And you know what else you can see? You can see my ring. On this side, look at this. This is not going to be good. See that? See that ring, how it's pressing? We, we love to wear rings, ladies. We do. And men, but this is going to poke right through that glove at some point. It's not going to be sanitary. So make sure we're not having a lot of jewelry on. You have those really long, fake nails. That is going to be an issue that we'll talk about later. All right, sanitizer and alcohol. It does not eliminate the need to wash your hands. So let's think about Clostridium difficile, C. diff, we call it that colon infection that people are getting all over the place now. Very contagious, passed from the bug in the feces, maybe if we're touching our hands or mouth or another resident, can live on surfaces, tends to form almost spore-like outer coating, so it's resistant to things that want to kill it, meaning that when you put sanitizer in your hands, it's not going to kill it. You need to wash your hands for the C. diff and for a lot of other reasons. I adhere to the old school rule about every third resident and every time you touch a resident and every time there's a mucous membrane involved and always with the C. diff or any infectious diseases, wash those hands, not just sanitizer. If you're using thickener, keep that, you know, that's one of your supplies. But guess what? Miralax that we use um, as a laxative agent actually interacts with thickeners and will thin the thickened liquids. And that can make it so that people will choke and aspirate, and that's not good. You could use something called Simply Thick, which is also a thickener. It's more of a gel, and it does not inter interact with Miralax. Or you can ask the pharmacy and the nurse to coordinate so that we can get maybe a different laxative so that doesn't happen. And Med-Aids run into this all the time, and sometimes they're brushed off. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to your Med-Aids. They will know, I'll tell you. Technical, more of this. These are the minimum standards, so make sure those orders match the meds. Triple check the labels, the orders, and everything, including the drug, when you're preparing those meds. Never, ever pass a medication that you've not prepared personally. Things happen. Residents fall down. It's the end of your shift. You've poured the meds. You have to go help the resident. You stick them in your cart. The next person comes on. Oh, I'll just pass them for you. Uh-uh not legally allowable, just not good sense, and such a chance to make errors and harm people. So we don't want to do that. You never ever pre-pour medications, no matter how much of a hurry you're in. I see a lot of those little souffle cups full of meds with little resident names on them lined up inside the carts when I open them up to do a check. We never want to do that. We don't save meds that weren't given. We don't put pills back in bottles, and we don't tape meds back into blister packs. If you've over poured a liquid, you pour the rest of it into the garbage. You don't pour it back into the bottle. Nurses, guess what? Insulins, breathing treatments, skin treatments are medications. So all these rules apply. When I go to do med passes, I get brushed off by nurses all the time. Oh, well, I don't have any medications. Well, do you have insulin? Yeah. Do you have breathing treatments? Yeah. Do you have skin treatments? Yeah. Those are medications. So all these rules apply, and people should be watching your med pass. We all know about the six rights, right? It's the right med, the right dose, the right time, the right person, the right route, the right documentation. You want to learn those six. You want to live them. You want to love them because they save lives, and they save you professionally. You don't want to make a mistake. We all get that feeling when we make a med error, and we've all, we've all made a med error. You don't want to harm people. So these six rights will help you not to do that. So the first one is, is it the right medication? Compare the medication to the medication order. Look at the medication. The Med-Aids, I will tell you, have caught a lot of prescription misfills. Pharmacy, pharmacists, make misfills. We don't like it, but we've all done it. And we thank you. If you find that before you give it to someone and you say, you know, this pill does not look right. I don't think they filled it right. Come tell someone. We are happy to look that up for you, checking the imprint on the pill. The right time. Are we giving it within the right time? Generally, we have an hour before or after, but some medications are more specific, like perhaps Caraphate, one hour before a meal. 
Some meds are with a meal, like Foslo, for example. Some are at least a half an hour before meals. So we're talking about maybe your Prilosex or, or your um, Prevacid, those kind of things. Make sure it's the right dose. If you're a nurse and you're doing calculations, because remember in Texas, Medaids aren't allowed to do calculations of this nature, double check your work. If possible, have another nurse check your calculation. I always have people do calculations with me. You just don't want to make a mistake. Make sure it's the right person. I've been involved in so many med errors where somebody gave the wrong medication to the wrong resident. So the resident wasn't on insulin but got insulin and went to the hospital. The resident wasn't on blood pressure medication but got blood pressure medication. A lot of the times it's people who aren't, who are pool, who aren't working there all the time, but very often it's people who are tired, who are working doubles, who just got confused. Compare the picture to the resident. You should have a picture, ideally on the MAR. Verbally ID the resident. Hello, Mrs. Butcher, I am here to give you your meds. Well, I'm not Mrs. Butcher. Well, that's good for you. She stopped you from making a horrible mistake. Make sure it's the right route. Check, 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 triple check before giving that medication. We're not giving, you know, vaginal suppositories by mouth. And that sounds ridiculous, but odd things do happen. Sometimes doctors will prescribe the eye drops as ear drops. And that's okay, but make sure that it's correct. But we never do ear drops as eye drops. So, you know, the right route can be trickier than you might think. The right documentation. You're going to document before, you're going to document during, and you're going to document after. Before is mainly for those narcotics or those controlled substances. Once you pop one out, you have to write that down on the count sheet because you can't put it back in and it's an inventory. And I get, oh, well, what if the resident doesn't take it? If the resident doesn't take it, you're going to document later that you wasted it on them there, but what you need to do is immediately when you pop it out or pour it out of the bottle, document on the count sheet, and that's before you give it to the resident. During, as you go on each resident, you are going to document which meds were given or not given, those kind of things. I don't want to see you going through and documenting on 15 people that you just passed, writing down every single med. You can't possibly remember everything accurately at that point. You just can't, and it's going to cause errors. And then after, if the med was refused or could not be given, you're going to document that as well. When you're going, we're going to go through some PO, some per orum medication rules. And these might seem basic, but let's just bone up on these a little bit. You're going to clean and disinfect that work area, that med cart. And you may have to do that several times during a shift. You're going to ensure that all your equipment you need is on hand, including your water and your med cups and your spoon, etc. Perhaps you might also need a med crusher with the little med crusher pouches. That is an important tool to have. Make sure that you have a blood pressure cuff. Make sure you have a place to write down your vitals, those kind of things. Do you have the vitals related to the med? Are they applicable and desirable? Did you do an apical pulse for digoxin? Digoxin generally requires an apical pulse, and not all people know that. Blood pressure meds. Is the blood pressure too low? Is the heart rate being affected? Are we doing orthostatic blood pressure checks? Do we need to? Is the resident alert and acting normally? If you go in and, you know, resident poly is just not acting right, go get the nurse, or if you're the nurse, do an assessment before we start giving people medications. Wash your hands before setting up the med. You could possibly use sanitizer if that's appropriate as well, but make sure hand washing is in there somewhere. Prepare the right med at the right dose at the right time. If, if it's crushable, you need to know it's crushable. Make sure you have a crush order first and keep a list in your MAR book about which meds are or are not crushable. Call the pharmacy if you have any questions. You want to crush things into a fine powder, not into the jagged edges. Don't touch meds with your hands when you're going to punch them out or when you're taking them out of the pouch when you're crushing them. So, for example, you have a med cup. We've all seen those little med cups. I see a lot of this. Sometimes people are, you know, just thinking I'm not watching. Oh, look, I touched it. That's gross. Don't, 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 don't do that. What you want to do is make sure, you know, you've got the right med, the right dose. You're going to position it right over, and you're going to push it out. And there you go. As time goes by, you know, you're going to get more proficient at that, but you're also going to get busier, and you're going to make mistakes. 
Now, I didn't touch that med. That's great. I'm going to take it to give to the resident, but what if I have five or six meds or different things going? Should I stack things on top that maybe have touched the bottom of other carts and just carry them all into the room? No, that's not sanitary. So what you're going to do is make sure that nothing else touches it and you're just going to carry it like so. It, if you're wearing gloves, that doesn't protect you from everything. Still don't touch people's meds. Okay. Now, check that you have the right med at the right dose and time and make sure that they're not expired. Every time you give a medication, you should check to make sure that it's not expired, especially PRN medications. Those go expired before we know it. Lock the med storage area while meds are given and you want to keep those keys. I'm going to hit that key thing hard. Don't leave those keys around. Identify the resident, ensure it's the right person. If the resident likes to hold the meds in their hand, some of them, you know, they like to hold them and they like to count. Do I have five pills? I always take five pills in the morning. Make sure that their hands are clean. Explain what meds you are giving and why. Always explain the reason for the meds or any treatment or procedure. It's important that you know and it's important that the resident knows. Ensure the resident is correctly positioned to prevent choking. You may have to rewash your hands because you're touching people. Use those gloves when you're touching people. Administer meds by the right route of administration and make sure that if you're setting medications or creams or anything down on that bedside table, that you've cleaned that bedside table. That's probably not very sanitary by the time you get in there. Always encourage water or fluids. I get a lot of, well, she only drinks, you know, this, or she only drink maybe a couple sips. Well, maybe that's true, but you want to encourage that all the time, not just what you think they usually drink. Try to get them to drink more. Older people are chronically dehydrated. Everyone these days is practically chronically dehydrated, I think. Watch that person. Wait to ensure that all meds are swallowed with no issues. Are they going like this after you give them the big potassium pill? Is it burning? Because that's not a good thing. That potassium can literally burn a hole in your esophagus if it sits there long enough, especially if they've had other issues, and in your stomach. Make sure there's some water it's going down. Are they coughing or choking or clearing their throat? Are they complaining of reflux? Make sure they've swallowed all those things. Dispose of your supplies after you're done. Wash your hands after giving the meds, possibly using some sanitizer. Are the resident's hands now clean? Did they touch their mouth and get slobber all over it? Wash their hands. Document immediately after giving the meds, or you could chart by exception. I'm not going to go into great detail, but that is also acceptable, where you would just initial everything as you pull it out, and then you'll go back and circle and explain thereafter. Those are both acceptable per the state operations manual. Double check those MARS before you move on to the next resident. Ensure you gave all those meds and that you initialed them. If you didn't give it, circle it, and then on the back, document why you didn't give it. Note and report any issues either to the nurse if you're the med aid or to your superior or to the doctor if you're the nurse, if you had any issues with the past or maybe some unusual responses to the meds. Liquids. All right. I'm going to go through it verbally and then we're going to take a little minute to show you what I mean. We all know liquids are tough. We do. When you open a bottle, you're going to place that lid up with the inside surface facing the ceiling to avoid contamination. You're going to pour that medicine at eye level and double check on a, plat, on a flat surface. You're going to use the meniscus. If you don't know what that is, I, I'll show you in a minute. For seizure meds, high dose morphine, anything less than five milliliters, anything that's really a high alert or a difficult issue, you want to use an oral syringe rather than pouring it into a cup. Never, ever, ever, if you're using an oral syringe, stick that into the bottle or a dropper. You want to use perhaps a lure lock top. The pharmacy can get these for you. They're usually blue. They screw on. You can screw then the oral syringe because it's threaded in there, and you can pull up just exactly what you need. So let me take a minute, and I'm going to come around and show you what I'm talking about with liquids. Okay. So when you are pouring liquid medications, I have a graduated cylinder in cylinder here because it's easier to see what I'm doing and, and what I'm talking about. The first thing to do is when you open that cap, not to set it down like so, because that's contaminating it and you're just going to put it right back on there, but to set it up like this. And I'm also not touching the inside or the top of the bottle with my hands. Whatever you're pouring it into, whether it be a cup or a cylinder, what you're going to do 
is you're going to pour some in and you're going to look at eye level. So if I'm going to pour, I'm going to pour for a while till I get close to where I want to be. And then I'm going to look. I'm going to look at eye level. You can't look up like so because you are bound to overfill. That's just what's going to happen. And you're looking for the meniscus. There's gravity that pulls everything down, as we know. And we can see, perhaps, where that meniscus is. It's right like a little C shape. You can see that the liquid comes up on the side and then goes right down towards the line. Where it comes down at the line is your level. When it comes up on the side, that's not what we're concerned about for measuring. So this right now is about 30 milliliters. So that's what we're looking for. So if you had to give someone two tablespoons, that's 30 milliliters. We're exactly right, right there. You can also do it with cups, and we do this a lot, but I'm going to show you just in a second where that can cause some overshooting. So I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying be real careful. So let's take a look at those cups as well. Medication cups, we're all familiar with these. They have the lines which are hard to see, but it'll tell you, sometimes they tell you drams, nobody uses those anymore. We like milliliters or cc's, which are the same thing by the way right here on the side. And you can tell that's kind of hard to see. And that's really what I'm trying to illustrate. We do use these, you can use these, but you have to be super, super careful. They're hard to see when you're looking straight down at it, like this. They're very hard to see when you're looking at it down at the side. We can see when we're looking at the lines on these little cups, if you're looking straight down, and we're, we're looking sort of down and at an angle, which is exactly what you would do if you were looking at it while you're passing meds. You can tell that we can't tell exactly where it is. Look, it's, you know, is it just at 10? It looks like it's under 15. And you'll notice I put a black mark there. That's like a little cheat trick that you can use where you just write on that little notch there. You put a black mark because it's easier to see. So as you can see, if, you, if you're looking at it straight ahead and it's on a mostly flat surface, this is as flat as we can get, but your med cart's pretty flat, let me tell you. This will show you exactly where that meniscus is and how much you're pouring. But as noted, it's difficult to tell with these little cups. But that little black line, if you choose to put a little black line where you're aiming, may help you as long as you're not overshooting or writing over things that you need to see. But it's important to be accurate, especially with high-dose morphine. All right, let's talk a little bit about the technical aspects of eye drops. And again, I'm, I'm going to rush through it quickly. These are just the basics. We're not going to show you exactly how everything's going to go, but I think you'll have the general idea, and we intend to hopefully do some videos where we're physically showing you what to do. But let's talk a little bit about what we need to do overall. First of all, privacy. People do eye drops just willy-nilly at the breakfast table, in bingo, wherever. Really, someone is in a vulnerable position with their head back. I can't see what's going on with my head back. So you need to help them out a little bit by giving them some privacy. Make sure that those eye drops are in date, especially your Zalatan. That's only good for 48 days after it comes out of the refrigerator. Make sure that you're washing your hands before wearing your gloves and washing your hands after. Ensure the resident that is seated and sort of comfortably able to put their head back. If they're in an area where they're cramped and pushed over, that's not going to be good for them, especially some of them have blood flow issues going up to the brain. You have to be pretty careful about that. Place the drop in the pocket of the eye, and this is probably not terribly attractive, but you know what I'm talking about. You're going to take your finger, you're going to help them pull that down, you can see how that just forms a little droopy loop. That is where those eye drops go. You want to use separate tissues. Believe it or not, some people don't believe this, but it's true. It's separate tissues for each eye, even if it's a glaucoma, <clears throat> excuse me, glaucoma medication, but especially if it's an eye antibiotic, you want to give them a tissue and let them pat each eye, or you will pat each eye individually with different tissues. We don't want to cross-contaminate. Some surveyors are also going to want you to use separate gloves in between each eye. And 
cross-contamination. It's going to take longer, but it, that's not unreasonable. Make sure that eye drop does not touch the eye or the eyelashes. And then double check that those drops are instilled correctly. There's no overfill in that pocket where you're just dropping stuff in and it's spilling out all over the place. It needs to get contact with the eye. I'm not sure if you guys know that much about penetration into the eye from eye drops, but can I tell you, it is not excellent. You have to let it get some contact. You want to make sure that you're waiting in between the drops. Generally, it's five minutes. There, there's this whole three to five minute thing, and I think people find that confusing. If you generally wait five minutes in between drops, different drops in the eye, three to five minutes in between the same drop in the same eye, then you're probably good. There are some, though, that require 10 minutes, such as Cosopt or Trusopt or Timolol XE. And we're getting more baby boomers that are showing up for us. Some of them wear contacts. If you give eye drops, you have to wait 15 minutes at least before you put those contacts in. Nasal sprays. Privacy. I can't tell you how many times I see people getting nasal sprays at the table, eating with other residents. That's just gross. Let's not do that. Make sure that they're in date. Make sure you wash your hands before. You wear your gloves. You wash your hands after. The resident's going to blow their nose first to clear that nasal passage. Tilt their head back. We're going to give them a tissue in case there's drainage. You're going to shake up that container if you need to and administer the correct dose into the correct nostrils. Things like calcitonin, those things that we use for osteoporosis, is actually only one nostril in one day and then the next day we put one spray in the next nostril. So make sure you're documenting that and you know which nostril we're putting it in. Clean the top of that sprayer. Don't just stick that up someone's nose cap it together and stick it in the cart. That's just gross. You want to wipe off the top of that sprayer, make sure it's clean, put the cap on it and store it nicely. You may need to go ahead and store it if you don't have the box or, or it's coming out of the box in a nice plastic baggie as well to keep everything clean. Some sprayers you can use alcohol wipes on. Some specifically say you can't because of the plastic. So make sure that you know which ones those are. When you're giving an inhaler, Inhaling up and in through the mouth. Remember, Medaids in Texas are not allowed to do this, by the way. You're going to make sure that inhaler is in date. For example, Simbacort goes out of date 90 days after you open that foil. Advair, 30 days after you open that foil. Cerevent, 42 days after you open that foil. Shake it up if it needs to be shaken. Make sure that resonant breathes out fully. Then, when you're depressing the canister or you've crushed the med, perhaps in the Advair, and they're ready to suck it in, they breathe in deeply and slowly. They hold their breath as long as possible and they breathe out slowly. You're going to wait one minute between puffs if it's the same medication to give it a chance to act. If it's albuterol, it needs a chance to get in there and open the airways and that's what the first puff does. That second puff opens up everything so we can really get in there and get that medication to work. You're going to wait five minutes between puffs of two different medications. If there's a steroid like an Advair, what you're going to do there is you're going to have them rinse and spit afterwards so that they don't get thrush. Make sure you're cleaning off and wiping that inhaler apparatus. Make sure there's a resident name on the apparatus itself so we don't switch them. That's super gross. And make sure that we store them in a clean area. Again, boxes and I like baggies. Keeps everything nice, neat, and clean. Patches. Let's do some privacy with patches. Don't just rip up people's clothes and slap patches on them willy-nilly. You want to make sure that the patch is in date and usually you want to open the patch a little bit before you're going into the resident room or before you're about to really wash your hands and everything because it's hard to get those patches open. So then it's a little open, it's ready to be taken out. You're going to wash your hands before, put on your gloves, make sure you wash your hands after you're done. Make sure the other patch has been removed and disposed of correctly if there was another one on there. Put it in the correct area which can be tricky depending on the patch. Hold it in place a little bit to make sure it sticks. Date and initial the patch. We need to know when you put that on in case there's ever any doubt. And then the MAR. Document where the patch was placed. And typically we rotate sites, but lytoderm we do not rotate sites in most cases. You put lytoderm right where it hurts. It's just giving you some lidocaine to numb the area that hurts. Topicals. Make sure the product's in date, wash your hands before, wear your gloves, hands washed after. Are you sensing a theme? I think you probably are. You're going to remove that cream from the jar or the tube. 
using an applicator or a tongue depressor and then perhaps you're going to take it and stick it in a cup or whatever it is you need to take into that room because you're not taking this tube into the room. That can cause contamination. So we don't want to do that. You're going to apply to the affected area as ordered and then, of course, observe your infection control areas, which means you're going to change gloves and wash hands between different areas and wounds. We're not trying to cross-contaminate those wounds there. And you're also always going to wash your hands before you leave the room. Make sure those topicals make sense. Um, we had a resident who, you know, for four or five years at one facility was getting stuff for a wound. Well, that wound was long healed, healed probably about a month after the resident got there, but we were still treating it. I'm not sure why. So make sure that doesn't happen. Check to see if the issue is resolved. If it's prophylactic, does it make sense? Are we putting, you know, the diaper rash cream on the buttocks? that's where it needs to go. Or are we putting it on the feet? That doesn't probably make a lot of sense in most cases. If it's a PRN, I get a lot of PRN creams. Oh, you know, use PRN. PRN what? Rash? Hives? What? Capsation is sort of a popular one nowadays. It's an extract from peppers. Make sure that we're not putting it anywhere near mucous membranes. Sometimes people forget when they write orders about that. I had an order for a resident to get capsation, and I have no idea why. It doesn't make a lot of sense in the perianal area. Well, this is a woman, and even if it were a man, I would have been concerned. You don't need to get hot pepper extract up near you know, the urethra, the vagina, those kind of things. That's going to burn. So we need to make sure that all these topicals make sense. Tubes and insulins. Are we going to go through all that in great detail? No, because it is so tricky. But let me give you the treetops highlights. Make sure you have privacy when you are doing tube meds and you're pulling that curtain. Make sure that you have privacy when you are doing insulin and that you are observing infection control. Make sure everything is in date and make sure that you have orders to crush things. And make sure the things that you have orders to crush are actually crushable. Doctors don't always know which things are crushable and which are not. They're very, very busy. They're depending on pharmacy and nursing and med aids to catch these things for them. So we got to do what we got to do. Insulins. So let me show you a little bit about the insulin. This insulin is hum Humalog. And I love this sticker. I just love it. It has discard after, you know, 28 days. You could even put a date on there, such as discard on 1130. And it says, you know, 28 days after opening. And it also has the date opened. You need to have the date opened. And I really prefer that you also put the date that you need to discard it. And most insulins are 28 days, as I think we know. And I hope we all know that it's for sterility, meaning bacteria, growth, yeast growth, those kind of things, rather than stability, whether or not the insulin will still work in most cases. But this way you don't have to calculate. You just say, hey, we're going to discard on this date, and we opened it on this date, and that's the way to go. Make sure that when you're putting those labels on here that you're not covering up the actual manufacturer's expiration or the lot number. Those are things that we need to have and control number we need to have just in case there's a recall. There was recently a recall on heparin, for example, the vials, because there were glass particulates. So you need to be able to see those things. So you date when opened and when it's expired, you use gloves, you have privacy. You never ever pull up more than one insulin at a time. I did a med pass once where a girl just pulled up five different insulins for three different residents, didn't label anything, carried them all in a big bundle and walked down to do it. And I said, oh, no, immediate jeopardy, we're not doing that. Killing people with insulin is not something that any of us are a fan of, and it can happen. You don't want to mix those up. If you were mixing insulins, and some are mixable, know which ones you can and cannot mix. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different forms out there that show which can be mixed and not mixed, and the package insert will also tell you that. If you're doing tubes, make sure, of course, you have crush orders. 
The meds are crushable. Keep that list at the front of your MAR book. Call the pharmacy if you need to. Get all that equipment ready. Make sure that you have the syringe to the flushes. Make sure that syringe was just open today. Make sure it's dated and in a package. It's not just laying around on the resident side table because that's gross. Check placement of the tube. Get those correct flushes in there. Use gravity. Don't push those meds in there. Make sure if you're crushing meds together, and this is a little controversial, that you can crush them together. It's ideal to do them separately if at all possible, and sometimes it's not. Make sure that those meds aren't being given with feedings. For example, Dilantin cannot be given within an hour or two of the resident's feedings because it'll bind and then their seizure med won't be absorbed. Won't be absorbed. We're gonna continue this perhaps in a different series because there's so, so much to it. Aspect number four, we're getting to the end here of our five aspects, infection control. We've hit it a little bit. You want to make sure that we're storing all of our meds away from contaminants. So make sure there's no bugs. I can't tell you. I've opened up carts and there's been roaches. It's just disgusting. Um, and make sure those insulins are in date and they're not growing bacteria. And remember that sterility versus stability. Make sure that we're hand washing appropriately and often. We're using sanitizer between residents and or always washing after touching mucus, mucus membranes or touching residents. Don't come to work when you're sick to spread disease. Don't touch your hands and face and nose and mouth and then go around and touch people's medications and hand that to them. That is inappropriate and gross. We don't want to be doing that. You're going to be spreading infections. So wash your hands. If you have to touch your hair, my bangs are going out right now. I'm always touching my hair. What you need to do is wash your hands before you go back and help residents with their meds. Rings can tear gloves. Necklaces can catch on resident clothing. And I'm going to say this, and I mean it. Most long-term care facilities do not have a policy about fake nails. I think they're pretty. I like them. But you know what? We shouldn't have them. That is my position on that. When we make um, medications in the hood and we're injecting a bunch of things and we're wearing gloves and we're getting them ready for residents, we are not allowed to have fake nails of any kind because they breed fungus. Anybody can tell you that. Fungus has spores. So you're not going to have to rip that nail off and rub it on something to spread a fungus to someone. So what you need to do is get a policy together that sort of excludes those fake nails. I know the fake nail people are going to come after me on that because we all love them and they're super pretty and they're expensive and you want to maintain them, but it does breed fungus. No pill touching, no apparatus or applicator touching. If you're going to spoon some of your creams out, you want to make sure that you're not just, you know, squirting them in your hand or touching the top of it at all. See how I'm touching this? That's gross. You can't be doing that. So it's important to pay attention to what you're doing, basically. Know your bugs. Know that C. difficile doesn't get killed by sanitizer and you have to wash your hands. Clean your pill counters. Sometimes, you know, we, we're scraping penicillin across a pill counter for some reason because we're counting it at the end of shift because some facilities do that. Well, if someone's allergic to penicillin, you can't have that penicillin dust on there when you're counting their hydrocodone later. So you need to make sure you're cleaning those in between. Clean your med crushers. Make sure that we're not crushing meds and getting the powder all over everything. When you use a med crusher, if you can, use these little pouches. I realize that they're expensive, but they're thick plastic. And they will help us to not contaminate the inside apparatus here with pill dust and make it gross and contaminated with things that can hurt other residents. Some people will use the pill crusher, stick a pill in one cup, stick the other paper cup on top, and crush that way. That's not altogether wrong, except for you have to be super careful. If you've got something that doesn't crush well, you're going to end up tearing this. You're going to get little paper bits in with what the resident's going to swallow, and that's not good either. Make sure, and we're at the end here, med safety. Make sure those meds are stored correctly. They are at the correct temperature. If it's stored in the refrigerator, it should be stored in the refrigerator. If it's stored in the refrigerator, then we take it out. Make sure it's in date. Make sure that the med card is clean, the top is clean, the inside's clean. 
Make sure that we're not storing things mixed all together by routes of administration because it's so easy to make mistakes. Deseed, so discontinued, and expired meds need to be removed from the meds with good orders as soon as possible on that same shift. If you were a nurse and you get a DC order, you need to pick yourself up, go to the med cart, get that med out of there, inform the med aid, change the MAR. Do what you need to do there, but it needs to be done on that same shift. Expired meds need to get out of there. I can't tell you how many med errors I've written up for people giving expired meds. Controlled substances, double locked. Make sure there's different keys to the cart and to that lockbox inside there. If the cart is traded off for any reason, like, oh, I had terrible tacos last night. I have to go. I'm going to go to the bathroom for about an hour. I'm trading off my keys. Someone needs to count those controlled substances. I'm sorry you're having an emergency there, but when those keys are transferred, you count those controlled substances and at every shift. Make sure those shift-to-shift -shift counts are performed and all signatures are in place. That's your insurance, ladies and gentlemen, that you didn't steal any meds and two people checked. That's what that is. Cart locked when not physically being touched. I know people say if it's in view, but people fall down, you get pulled away, then that cart's open, you have dementia residents picking through there, you have family members picking through there. No, if you're not touching that cart, you have the keys and it's locked. Don't hide those in a med book either. I'll see people sort of, oh, you know, under the tissue box or closing up the med book with the keys in it. Don't do that. The cart, when it's not in use, needs to be visible to the nursing station or locked away in another area. It can't be down at the end of Hall B where nobody can see it. All right. Five elements of a great med pass. Professionalism, HIPAA, and dignity. Technical stuff, the crushing, the orders, the administration techniques. Infection control, that hand washing and all that. Med safety, is it stored at the right temperature? Is it not expired? Are those carts locked? These are things we have to worry about to have a great med pass. There's no such thing as a perfect med pass. There's no such thing as perfection. We can only get better as we develop these skills. Med passes are important. Med passes are technically, technically difficult. They just are. Remember that these are frail people that are depending on you. Sometimes we get busy and it's just a job. But professionalism in long-term care means we're caring for people. So be careful with their medications and be careful with them. Think of these five elements as ways to be caring using the special skills of your profession. And most importantly, these elements all came about from actual harm coming to a person. That's why all these state regulations exist. They all came from something horrible happened to someone. So they're not arbitrary and they sometimes seem like just an awful lot, but you're really helping people by following these. And if you have any questions, please, please contact us and we'll put up a slide that gives us, um, gives you our contact information. No questions are stupid and we all learn from one another. I can't tell you how much I've learned from med aides and nurses bringing up questions because you guys are in it, you're in the trenches. You know what's going on, and all of a sudden you'll say, well, what about this? And those of us on the other side watching you do the med pass go, huh, what about that? And we can all work together to make it safer and better for the residents. So thank you so much for your time.